Hello, welcome back. I'm the Erroneous Kaiser. Today we're doing a little bit of Golden Age horror comic history. Today we're talking about the series Chamber of Chills. Chamber of Chills had a run of 26 issues. It ran from 1951 to 1954, right at the peak and very quick decline of Golden Age horror. Harvey Comics published Chamber of Chills. It also had a few well-known horror comics coming out at the time. Witches' Tales, Tomb of Terror, and Black Cat Mysteries. Of those, uh, Witches' Tales came out first. Uh, it had the cover date of January 1951. The first issue of Chamber of Chills had a cover date of June 1951 and it was actually numbered number 21. Around this time, publishers would kind of play a little loosely with the numbering of comics. There were some extra fees and extra taxes they had to pay to put new number ones out on the racks on the newsstands. They'd change the title and just continue the numbering from there. Blondie Comics Monthly is said to be the predecessor of Chamber of Chills, but also there was another spin-off comic from Blondie that came out at, at the same time as Chamber of Chills in 1951. They were both labeled number 21. This is also weird because the number 20 issue of Blondie came out in 1950. There was about a year long gap between the 20 of Blondie and Chamber of Chills and Daisy and her pups. Um, they had actually continued numbering. So the month that Chamber of Chills was out on the racks, Blondie Comics Monthly was at number 37. So there weren't any real you know, hard rules about this. I think they were just, yeah, doing whatever the heck they wanted, just pulling numbers out of their butt. Chamber of Chills also did whatever the heck they wanted with numbering. They published 21 through 24, and then what would have been number 25, they just went to a regular number five. So 21, 22, 23, 24, one, two, three, four, and five is five. This numbering continued until 26, and then they changed the title from Chamber of Chills to Chamber of Clues. That comic ended up going only for two issues before it was canceled. There are many creators who had a part in the art and the stories of Chamber of Chills. I really want to like highlight maybe four of them who really did uh, a lot of the heavy lifting. First off, Al Avison. He did not so much interior stuff, but he did do a lot of the covers. And actually, his last published known comic book contribution uh, in all of comics was actually number 26, the last issue of Chamber of Chills. Lee Elias is another guy who did a lot of work on covers, but he also did a lot of stuff on the interiors as well. He did a lot of work for Harvey, and he also did some stuff over at National Comics, what would be DC, and then when it was DC as well. He actually was the co-creator of the DC villain Eclipso, who made his first appearance in House of Secrets 61. Elias was the artist on the probably most well-known cover for Chamber of Chills, which is number 19. This comic is always up there real high on Golden Age horror comic collectors want lists, including mine. And it is even well known among people who are fans of punk music for the band The Misfits using it as the cover for for their single Die Die My Darling in 1984. And Glenn Danzig, the, well, one of the founders and lead, first lead singer of the Misfits, who then went on to have his own band, Danzig, has repeatedly in the past just taken stuff straight from comics and used it as major images for his albums and even for the image of his band. Uh, if you're a fan of Danzig, that kind of, that demon skull, it's taken straight off of a comic. And that's that's where it was first. No, did nobody he ever said anything. He, he never got sued for it. He, everyone was just like, okay, yeah, that comic art is now the image for Danzig. People know that as the image for Danzig more than from the comic. Next guy is Bob Powell, who probably has the most work to put into Chamber of Chills. He did a lot of work for Harvey, doing art for Sheena of the Jungle and Dr. Mystic. He was uh, also a co-creator of Black Hawk. I think probably one of the coolest things I think is he did the final pencils for the Mars Attacks trading cards. He had Wally Woods rough sketches and he did final pencils before Norman Saunders painted them. I think that's pretty cool. 
Last guy I want to talk about is Howard Nordstrand. Uh, he actually started as Bob Powell's assistant, but very soon after that, he kind of was getting, you know, work on his own. When he first came on with Harvey Comics, he was tasked with kind of emulating the EC Comics horror style. Uh, he did it so well that they were like, oh no, forget emulating it. Just kind of just do your own thing. He was very talented that way. After the implementation of the Comics Code Authority, however, uh, he was looking for more work and, there, you know, there was a lot less work at that time. So he made a uh, transition over to doing more commercial art. So, how did the Comics Code Authority affect the Chamber of Chills and Harvey Comics specifically? Frederick Wortham's book, Seduction of the Innocent, did mention a story from Chamber of Chills specifically. Uh, Chamber of Chills number seven, actually. The story ends with a husband being turned into a giant crab and then eating his wife, who was already dead because she was eaten by a bunch of other giant crabs. What Wortham said in his book was, if we found some culture where we found out they gave stories like this to their children, um, he was pretty much saying we would totally understand why that civilization was no longer around. Which, like, if you think about it for two seconds, is total bullcrap. So after the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency concluded in 1954, uh, resulting in the self-censorship of the comics by the comics, uh, with the Comics Code Authority, it made for a lot less topics they could talk about in comics and it made for a lot less jobs. Harvey Comics ceased all of its horror titles and focused a lot more, well, almost exclusively, on stuff for little kids. Uh, the, the characters that were coming out of Harvey at the time were, who had been coming out for years previous to that as well, uh, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost, The Hot Stuff, The Little Devil, Richie Rich. And so Chamber of Chills was no more. However, you know, some stories were retooled or retold uh, in other magazines, black and white magazines during that time. It was okay to have horror comics as long as they were magazine size and in black and white. That's how they could get away with the censorship that was being put on them. I really don't get it. I guess the image was, you know, this size book is for children and this size, slightly bigger size and black and white. That's sure, you could sell that to, to uh, anybody. All right, so that's a little tight history on Chamber of Chills. The main reason why I started this, however, was so I can show off some Chamber of Chills that are in my collection. I only have two at the moment. First up here is Chamber of Chills. This is number 13. Uh, I really like this one. I think it's pretty cool. This kind of, you know, zombie coming out of the grave, pulling a dude in. I think it's pretty awesome imagery. And the other one I have is number 17. I got this one in a big lot of Golden Age comics that I got. Uh, I, I went through most of those in another video. We'll just go over a quick rundown of the stories. Number 13, opening up, we can see here the kind of table of contents. There's a little blip as an introduction to Chamber of Chills, and we have a list of the four main stories in here. There are maybe one or two prose stories besides these four, but the, you know, the main attractions are these. The first one, Man Germ. A guy goes into a statue, but it's really the body of a giant. The things, some dudes, I guess you'd call them colonizers or explorers or something like that. I, probably British, right? I don't know. <laughs> they go to steal some of these ancient jewel artifacts from the native people's temple, and a massive army of man-eating ants comes after them and devours them all. Sorry, spoilers. The Lost Race is about an underground civilization and that is de-evolved because of the gases uh, that are underneath the earth. Man in the Hood, the last one that's listed right here, is about a guillotine executioner and he's like haunted by his headless kills. He uses a guillotine to execute people. He doesn't execute guillotines. Number 17, same deal, we got the blip on the side. A first story listed here is Amnesia. An evil guy regains his memory and he realizes how evil he really is. Next is Big Fight, it's a boxing match, but actually in the end, it was actually like, probably sperm, I guess, because a baby comes out and the winner of the fight is the baby that comes out. So I think it's about sperm, man, weird. Next is The Collector. 
It's about a hunter who meets this like monstrous looking kind of doppelganger who's then hunting him. And Bridge is about a guy who's murdered by being thrown off a bridge and he comes back for revenge as a revengeful zombie. These comics, they're all public domain now, so you could just go on the internet and just find them and read them if you want to. I wanted to be careful with my comics, uh, so actually I did use some resources from the internet, some of these, some of the pictures. Right, I hope you enjoyed wading into the history of Chamber of Chills. If you did, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Anything you can tell me about what you'd like to see would give me a probably great bit of motivation as well. Hope you enjoyed watching. I'm the Ronnie Skyzer. See you next time.